So it's been a technology that's been around for, well, around 80 years. It's known as the lie detector. And it's something that is legally allowed to be used in a number of situations. But the question would be, with this ancient technology, I mean, really, if you consider technology in the way that's progressed over the years, is it still the best way to try and figure out if somebody is attempting to be deceptive or not? And it may not be. To talk a little bit about it this morning, we have a couple of guests on the wake-up call. Robert Gross is one of those. He's retired from the Lane County Sheriff's Department after serving 27 years Uh, He's somebody that's trained as a polygraph examiner, and he brings with him Mr. Peter Shannon, a licensed sex offender treatment provider here in Eugene. So first off, to both of you, welcome to the Wake Up Call. We appreciate you coming in. Thank you. Good morning. All right. So, uh, Robert, let's, let's start with you. You initially reached out to us about, um, this new technology that appears uh, to be quite a bit more effective than the traditional, I guess, if you will, lie detector. Um, let's let's start with the the lie detector itself, and how does that thing even work? Okay. Well, I want to be absolutely clear about something. I was an intern examiner. I hadn't received my full license because I saw this newer technology and I decided I wanted to go to it. And so I suspended my uh, effort to obtain my full license in Oregon. So full disclosure. Um, The lie detector basically works that there are three measurements, biological measurements that are being taken during an exam. You have a blood pressure cuff on your arm. You have what are called pneumo tubes on your chest and on your abdomen. And then you have some electronic uh, connectors on your fingers, which are looking for how well electricity passes through your skin. When your skin is damp, it will pass a little bit better. That's called the EDA, or electrodermal activity. Person sits in a chair. They're given a series of about uh, five minutes worth of questions, and those biological markers are recorded. The charts are printed out, and the examiner interprets the data on those charts. Mm-hmm. Okay, and that technology has been around for how eighty long? years. The FBI used it, started using it in the nineteen thirties, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. and it can be used in certain circumstances. Explain <clears throat> what those circumstances that it can be used in, because they're not admissible, quote unquote, in court, right or wrong. That's correct. Uh, it can't be used in court. Um, it has to pass an evidentiary standard. It's called the Dauber test. And because it's not demonstrated to be sufficient to pass that test, it's not allowed in court. It can be used in a parole and probation hearing. It can be used um, for investigative purposes for law enforcement. It can give an indication of whether you have the right person or the wrong person. And then an interview is done after that. The federal government who used it for years to try to determine if somebody's lying or uh, being truthful about a matter, but not in a court proceeding in trial. And Peter, you being a, a, a sex offender treatment provider, for folks that have been uh, convicted of sex crimes, it is something that is used in your line, correct? Been using polygraph examinations for probably. 30 years um, Uh outside of our office as well as approximately, I would guess, in the neighborhood of around 8,000 polygraph examinations we've done inside our office. At one point in time, we had a in-house polygraph examiner uh, that uh, principally tested all of our clients on a regular basis, oftentimes weekly, uh, depending on what our particular program caseload was at any given time frame. and we anticipate continuing the use of polygraph. It's a valuable tool. Um, it's uh, reasonably effective and more often than not produces results that are really quite useful in terms of monitoring community safety, compliance with the program requirements, the treatment contract, which is uh, a very detailed four-page contract. We also 
assist with parole and probation in terms of monitoring uh, compliance with uh, supervision requirements, either on probation, um, parole, or post-prison supervision. Well, what kind of things are you, I mean, specifically, are you looking for uh, with those contracts with those particular sex offenders? I mean, what specific things are you trying to, f- to find out? Well, first and foremost, uh, we want to know whether or not they're conducting themselves in the community in a fashion that would be safe and without any intent to be malicious towards other citizens, principally children, but oftentimes adults as well. So when they get released from an institution or get placed on probation from the courts, they have a very specific list of things that they can and can't do. Um, and their life in, in many regards is uh, monitored and uh, in some ways taken over by people who are working to supervise their safety in the community. Um, their uh, choice and free will has been reduced fairly dramatically by places where they can go, people who they can uh, socialize with, activities that they can engage in, um, social events and those types of things, whether or not they're allowed access to uh, computer technology or screen time, whether or not they're allowed access to minor children uh, with or without chaperones. Uh, We have chaperone training programs that assist um, with community safety by attaching people to the clients that we're working with uh, so that when they're out in the public and around uh, social gatherings where there are children, Um, that there is somebody with them at all times to ensure uh, compliance with basic requirements. Okay. Robert, a question for you. When talking about the polygraph, if you were to have three people that worked the polygraph, that, you know, were reading polygraph experts, Mm -hmm. is it potential that you could get three different outcomes or predictions as far as what the outcome was? Three different Depending on the uh, examiner, maybe? That's possible. The reason why, and um, this is why the state of Oregon requires that uh, there's an extended period of time to have full licensure for polygraph, is that you have to be mentored through at least 200 exams to learn how to interpret the data properly. Um, Whether that uh, reading that you get is something that you would score a positive or a negative against the person trying to uh, pass the exam. So you have to learn to interpret it, um, and then you're tested on whether you have a decent skill level at doing that interpretation. So yes, it's possible, and especially when somebody is going through an internship, and even, you know, frankly, um, people who are fully licensed can have a slightly different interpretation of what they would score or not. So yes, it's possible. And then you come across, well, before we go any further, before you ask that question, a polygraph exam takes how long to do it properly? To do it properly um, takes a minimum of 90 minutes, and it can take several hours, depending upon what some of the government ones take uh, four or five hours to do. All right. So you're looking at about a five-hour test. And, I mean, a lot of it and a lot of the tests to determine the outcome depends on nuances of semantics, it almost sounds like. A lot of it has to do with the skill of the examiner, the quality of the test. Okay, but the the types of questions that you have to ask to get certain responses, I mean, you have to have a baseline Right. To be able to get to the point where you can tell whether a person is ostensibly trying to be deceptive or not, right? Right. And so that's the skill of the operator, to craft those questions so that you come up with a fair exam for the person taking the test. And how much preparation does it take going into an exam with somebody to put those particular questions together? Well, that's why the exam takes a minimum of 90 minutes. Usually a person will fill out a form um, answering a whole raft of questions, and then you will interview the person for a while, and based on uh, the answers on the questionnaire that you've had them fill out and the interaction you've had with that person, you formulate the questions, uh, construct the test, and then give the exam. Okay, good, Rob. Okay, well, 
Um, so you find eye detect, which I'm curious, where where did you first come across this new technology in lie detector? Well, during um, during the time that I was an intern, you have to keep up on training. Well, I went up to um, a training up in Washington State, and there were um, some vendors there from a company called Converis. They had a new technology. It was called Eye Detect, and what it was was a technology that tried to detect deception that was a totally different technology than polygraph. And it was demonstrated, and I looked at the math of how accurate the test was, and I decided that I wanted to go with that equipment and that system over polygraph. What was the accuracy? The accuracy um, that the company puts out uh, for somebody telling the truth, determining whether somebody can actually, who is telling the truth is actually telling the truth, it's at 89%, which is almost 90%. For catching somebody who is telling a lie, it's um, at 83%. So it's got a mean of um, 86% accuracy. Compared to what with the polygraph? About 85 to 86% accuracy and on, should, a, on a really well done polygraph. And we should say the, the average length of time for eye detect is, is how long? Half an hour. And then you have the report in five minutes. And it's all computerized. The scoring is not interpreted, interpreted by any person. It's done through a computer algorithm. So enormous amounts of data are gathered through that 30-minute test. As a matter of fact, um, can I talk a little bit about the difference in the technology? We sure. talked about the, mm-hmm. the, three indica- the three sensors for polygraph. Eye detect works totally different. It has nothing to do with your breathing, your heart rate, your respirations blood pressure, uh, what it has to do with how much of your brain is engaged to answer a question. So if I were to say to somebody, for example, what's 2 times 15? 30. Everybody knows it. It's just recall. They learned it in school. Mm -hmm. But if I say to them, what's 17 times 15? They have to think for a minute because it's not just recall. They have to think about their answer and construct it. That takes more brain activity more the brain lights up. The same thing happens, the researchers found, that when a person is recalling a memory, it takes less brain activity than constructing an answer. And that's what polygraph doesn't measure. That's what um, I detect is measuring. And that extra brain activity creates involuntary movement and changes in the eye. And that is what is being looked at with infrared cameras, and during the course of a 30-minute test, you've got 100,000 data points being gathered from each eye. That's all encrypted, sent up to uh, an algorithm. It, the algorithm scores it. No human scores it, and the result comes back. So the interpretation where somebody might get a different score than another examiner, all of that is gone. It's just math. Who came up with this? Um, Actually, in Washington State, there were two uh, scientists that were hiking. And they were were wondering whether there was any, um, as they say, uh, the the eyes are the window to the soul. They wondered if there was any merit in that old saying. And so they decided that they would see if maybe um, a technology that could measure eye measurement was viable, and that was like in 2003. So they spent the la- the next 12 years or so developing this, at the University of Utah, and came up with a technology that actually proved that it is possible that there are in- there are involuntary movements in the eye, changes that happen when a person lies, that don't happen when a person is telling the truth. And what's interesting is that. It's not just one measurement. I mean, it's not just a pupil dilation and a constriction. There are 16 variables in the eye that the computer is looking at, taking 60 samples a second during the test. That's how much data is being gathered for scoring. How easy is it, in your mind, uh, to manipulate as somebody that, say, is getting a a, uh, lie detector test? Uh, Is it possible to manipulate 
that test so that you can get a positive score even though you go in purposely trying to be deceptive? You know, I'm, I'm in an area where I don't want to go too far because um, I'll answer your question directly, but I want to add a caveat first if I could. Yeah. It's sort of like this. <clears throat> Some people really like Windows computers. Yeah. They like the way they work. They're used to them. Some people really like Apple products. Mm-hmm. Okay. Both will work. One person thinks the Apple is better. One person thinks the Windows space is better. Okay. Both will work. And both have strengths and weaknesses. Polygraph and I detect are the same. So if you look online or you talk to people, yes, you can be trained to screw around with a polygraph test. You can. Okay. What about then I detect? Well, um, at this point, the way the tests are constructed, there are not any, as a matter of fact, uh, Charles Hans, Dr. Charles Hans from Boise State, who's an expert on countermeasures for polygraph, has looked at this and he said, and their research has come up, that there are no known effective countermeasures for eye detect at this point. They can't find any. Mm. So, for instance, if you try to um, uh, manipulate uh, through breaking the rhythm of response that the infrared cameras uh, uh, lock on to both eyes by either blinking or by looking away or distracting, there's a certain percentage of contact time between the camera and the eye itself that is required to even score the test. I took uh, the test quite some time ago as a demonstration and inadvertently kept looking down at the mouse to make sure that I was clicking on the right mm -hmm. and left uh, side accurately. And uh, I broke my gaze from the infrared cameras over too many times, over too long of a period of time, inadvertently, not trying to be deceptive. And the test, when we tried to score it, the test came out as being unscorable due to non-compliance. Now, that wasn't my intent to do that, but the parameters around what is the necessary guidelines for compliance were broken by me uh, unintentionally, but nonetheless, the, the algorithm indicated the score or the test was not scorable due to noncompliance. Now, Robert, I took the test and was trying to be deceptive. You did the same thing? No. Oh. I, I didn't look away, but I was trying, I was altering uh, different rhythms and things like that as, as to where I would, you know, trying to deceive and, and make it seem like I was having difficulty when I wasn't. Um, and well, why did you do that? <laughs> because I'm thinking if, if, if somebody is, if somebody is trying to avoid, yes, if, if they're absolutely, if they're going to keep themselves out of jail or having to pay money, they're, they're going to do the same yeah. thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I was trying to think, okay. Yeah. And you couldn't beat it. No, he, he, he picked a number uh, the computer questioned him about what number he picked. And he was able to put his number not in second position. It picked three numbers, most likely, second, most likely, and third. And his second and third most likely were a whisker apart. And he was able to deceive that test. But I've done about 50 of those tests. You are the second person who has not scored in first position of those 50 tests. And, and the other tests that, uh, of that 50 that um, the equipment didn't correctly identify the number was Peter when he was noncompliant. But you and I talked afterwards, by the way, and I showed you what an actual test question set was like. Right. Yeah. No. It, and you would not have been able to use that strategy. I, I, was, I was doing remedial when you look at the questions and when it gets to be a little bit headier a, a subject, um, I would have a different... I definitely would have a different, I think, response and different mindset. It'd be yeah. it'd be tricky, right? The the strategy that yeah. you employed to screw around with a very simple. I mean, the test I gave you uses only one of those sixteen markers in the eyes. No, oh. that's it's, it's assessing, and it's a very short test. It's like five or six minutes, and it's taking the minimum amount of data that the computer needs to make a determination 
of what it believes the deception was. And because the questions were predictable, a very short test, right. only one out of 16 markers, yeah, it's possible to mess with that test a little bit. But when you get into an actual test, um, nothing has been found that works. And who, okay, so we maybe are introducing to a lot of people out there, I detect for the first time, right. but it's, it's out there. People are using this in the world. Where is it being utilized? Well, it's being used, um, well, as a matter of fact, uh, there was a news release by uh, Converse that uh, the Israelis, for one, are going away from polygraph and going almost exclusively to eye detect in, in their investigative work. It's available in 33 states where it's legal in the United States, 40 countries, 30, 25 or 30 languages, because you always want to take the test in the person's native tongue. You don't want mm. an, uh, a translation going on because that takes additional brain activity. So you always test the person in their native tongue. You know, you said it's available in 33 states. Is it being used by law enforcement or folks like Peter here uh, who works with sex offenders? I mean, is it being used in those regards or is it just there if they want to use it? Well, if I could plug a website. <laughs> yeah, all I mean, we're, we're, we're kind of short on time, but go right. ahead. Um, the website I have, maybe we can mention it later, uh, gives a list of all the states where it's allowed, under what circumstances. It's being used by law enforcement, it's being used by investigators, um, sex offender treatment providers, and also, interestingly enough, I detect was allowed in federal district court during trial in the state of New Mexico because it passed the Dauber test for validity of evidence, and that just happened recently in the past month or so. So it was used in a trial. Yes, used in a trial at the federal level in New Mexico. Talk um, about two five four five. Two five four five House Bill two five four five in is, Oregon, right? That's the House bill. It's our effort to get eye detect available in Oregon. So if law enforcement, if uh, treatment providers, if other people wanted to be able to have access to it as an option, other than polygraph or in addition to polygraph, they would have that option. But the way a statute, the, the statute that deals with deception detection was written in 1975, the way that statute's written, no technology other than polygraph can be used in Oregon. Even though, like you had talked about uh, when, we f when we first started this conversation, all the technological advances that have been made, it's, it would mm -hmm. be very much like um, saying to people, Ap Apple uh, was started about in 1975 or six, saying to everybody in Oregon, you can use a Windows-based product for anything you want, in private use, business, but you can't use an iPhone. You can't use any products that were um, invented after 1975 if it's not Windows-based. You can't do it. You can do it in Washington State, but you can't do it here. That just doesn't make any sense to me not to have that option. And who was it that, that actually fought against this House bill? Well, we have a rough. You're over here smiling. <laughs> I like it. Well, well, I think two things. Happen. Do you want to answer that question? If we have uh, an option, uh, I'm not sure. All right. Want. Yes. Okay. I don't want to. I don't want to sound nefarious. Two things. I think um, the polygraph community is pretty leery of this because they see it as a replacement. The problem is I don't see it really as a replacement. It's sort of like if, if you've ever had a TB test and you test positive, right? Uh -huh. You go get a chest x-ray. You get a different technology to verify that. If you use a polygraph and an idea tech together, your confidence rate that you have the right decision goes up to okay. 98%. That's great. So you don't see it as a replacement. Uh, you see it no. as a, a tandem. They're okay, kind of, but who was it that was against this? All right. I think uh, two things were in play. One, it's new technology, and people had trouble getting their heads around. This is not 
polygraph, but we already have polygraph laws. Why do we need to make any changes in the law? They didn't understand this was not polygraph. It was new. It really wasn't well understood. And I think there was some pushback from the polygraph community as well because this is a threat. It perceived to be a threat to their industry and people who would make money like polygraph examiners. Peter, you're over here smiling. What? Well, it's, um, it's just human nature to fight anything that's new. Okay. Um, it breaks traditional mindsets of what's appropriate, what's applicable, and what works. What I want to underscore is that um, Robert's ab- absolutely accurate when he says that the, that the efforts at utilizing eye detect will actually augment what polygraphy has already done in some ways, in that if you put the two of them together, they, they almost form a per- perfect picture in terms of either truth or deception. When the two protocols um, corroborate uh, the same position. Um, The the bill was not passed forward out of the Senate uh, for the reasons that we're sort of alluding to. Um, Some of it may have been misinformation. Uh, Some of it may be an absence of, uh, of accurate information that the decision makers we're not willing to, do, to move forward. We've met with uh, Senator James Manning and are attempting to um, reinvigorate the bill with this upcoming legislative session. Uh, we think the research and the data is overwhelming. Um, and yeah, but are they, are the politicians that are making these decisions, are they getting good data? Good, are they getting good information? We're trying to give them good data and good information. Um, and we believe that just it's just a matter of time. I think the the decision in New Mexico was huge because, uh, as, as has been previously dis- discussed, uh, polygraphy has never been able to pass the Daubert uh, test for uh, empirical validity at the time of uh, trial. So in New Mexico, when they finally uh, introduced all of the data and the research around validity and reliability, and the court determined, yes, it does pass the Daubert standard, that is a huge decision uh, at the federal level. And we think that that will simply uh, contribute to a ripple effect that will expand over a period of time. And the fact of the matter is that when the Israeli Defense Force decides to utilize it in its counterterrorism, I mean, my goodness, what stronger endorsement can you have when a country who is uh, uh, amidst a, a, a sea of turmoil is using technology of this sort to uh, defend itself? I mean, you can't uh, establish a more crucial application of technology than that. All right. Uh, for folks that want to find out more, give the website very quickly. We are out of time. The website is credibilityscreening.com. And there is a link for all the information, published research, peer-reviewed research, informational videos, and also a link to the Oregon legislature. If you read and, and like what you see and would like to support Bill 2545 or encourage support for it, there's a direct link where you can say, please take a look at this. That would be great. All right. Robert Gross on the wake-up call with us, and also Peter Shannon, and iDetect is the technology, credibilityscreening.com, the website. You can go there find out more at 756 News Radio, 1120 KPNW.